invite you this evening that you would open your Bible with me to the book of Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. As last week we talked about how both Abraham and Lot had a decision to make. They had a decision to make, and what we noticed here is that Lot chose for himself, while Abraham allowed God to choose for him. And we've titled the message, a very timely message, not only for us as a state, but even for you as a believer, as an individual, because the title of the message tonight is this, The Consequences of Disobedience. There are some consequences to disobedience when we choose for ourselves. When we choose the way of Sodom, the way of the world, instead of the way of the promised land or the way of God's promises. And as we're studying the life of Abram here and his wife Sarai, we're learning through the school of faith. But it's very important that even as we enroll in that school of faith, that it's important that we know that we'll never know what's going to happen next. Oftentimes, God calls you to take a step of faith, and you don't know what that step will lead to next. So they go from a boundary dispute, from disputing over flocks and herds and land and boundaries and borders, now to gearing up for battle. Because here, in chapter 14, it's all a battle. But how many of us know even tonight that the battle belongs to the Lord? Amen. The battle belongs to the Lord. And God allows this in our lives as we're enrolled in the school of faith to mature us, to mature every part of our lives, but maturity, know this, it doesn't come easily. You don't just wake up one day and you're spiritually mature now. It takes a lot of trials and tests and steps of faith, and we have to know this, that there can be no growth without challenge. If you want growth in your life, it's going to come through challenge. It's going to come through adversity. It's going to come through trials, through affliction. And there could be no challenge, notice this, without change. Change always brings challenges. Someone said, life is change. Growth is optional. You choose wisely. In life, you will have changes. Growth will be optional. Choose wisely. Make sure you make the right decision so that you're not like Lot making a choice for yourself instead of being like Abraham who consulted God, who waited on God, who learned the lesson, was patient, and let God choose for him. And in fact, we see here in in chapter 14 that Lot chose the world, and because he chose the world, notice this, he became a captive of the world. When you choose the world you will become a slave of the world. So we see here Lot's captivity, but you also see Lot's rescue here. And there's an important lesson as we continue looking at this chapter here, because we see that it's important that we separate ourselves from the world and surround yourself with people who are pursuing God. That you would separate yourself to be with people that are pursuing God. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 22, Paul told Timothy this, flee also youthful lusts, but pursue, run after, chase this, righteousness, faith, love, peace, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. What are we to do to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord with a pure heart? We are to surround ourselves with people that are calling on the Lord with a pure heart. We know the Bible says that beware of evil company because it corrupts good habits. And Lot, what he did is he surrounded himself with Sodom, with Gomorrah. He surrounded himself with the world and it led to his downfall. So in chapter 14, we see kings, but we see conflicts. There are many kings mentioned in chapter 14 here, but there's only one king of righteousness. The king and priest Melchizedek, which represents and gives us an illustration of Jesus in the Old Testament. 
This chapter is the first mention in the Bible where you see kings, where you see wars, where you see priests mentioned, where you see the bread and the wine mentioned together, and where you see also the topic of tithes mentioned in the Bible. And we're going to see Abraham in the school of faith as the watcher, number one, the warrior, number two, and the worshiper. Would you write that down? This evening, Abraham the watcher, Abraham the warrior, and Abraham the worshiper. And in all these three roles, he exercised his faith in God, and he made the right decision. Why? Because he was a man of action, and he was a man of decision. Today, I pray that you leave tonight as a man and woman of action, and a man and woman of decision, that you don't just sit on the sidelines in this life, But you stand up for truth, for righteousness, as a person of action. That you would not be passive, but that you would stand up for truth. And notice what it says here in chapter 14, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Sinar, Ara, king of Elasar, Kerdalamir, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of of the nations. Now try pronouncing that all at home tonight when you go home. This is verse 2, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemaber, king of Zeboliam, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these join together in the valley of Siddam, that is the salt sea. What is the salt sea? The dead sea. For those that went to the Israel trip recently, we were just there. The lowest elevation on earth, the Dead Sea. And it says that they gather there, these kings, and notice what happens here. They join together in this valley, and in verse 4, 12 years, they serve uh, Kedur al and then in the 13th year, they rebelled. What happens here is that we see the first sign or story here the first time in the bible where there's war that war broke out in the king or the reign of king of amraphel and what's important here is that you see history we know that it's his story history is his story what what is written here helps us today better understand how god worked out his great plan of salvation that's why we history is important in the bible Because it teaches you the plan of redemption, of salvation to the entire world. And in the Bible, historical facts are oftentimes windows for spiritual truths. What do we see here? The spiritual truth of redemption in chapter 14 of Genesis. Historical facts are oftentimes in the Bible windows for biblical truth and spiritual truths. And we see that four kings in verses 1 and 4 gather together. They formed a confederacy of kings, and they went against five city-states. What did they do there in the plain of Jordan? They went against those kings, and they now overtook them. They had them pay now homage to them for 12 years. And what happens here is they, they invade the plain of Jordan. They bring those other five kings under subjection. Now, this is not a minor thing. This is a really major international conflict that happens here. But it says that after the 12th year, in the 13th year, they rebelled against this king, against the king that had them subject to him. They wanted to be free from the dominion of the king. And notice in verse 5, as it continues, it says, And in the 14th year, Kedurlomar, the king, that were with him came and attacked Rephaim, and Ashtoreth, Kernaim, the Zuzim, in Ham, the Emim, in Shavith, Kirjathim, and the Horites in the mountains of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is in the wilderness. And then they turned back and came to En Mishpah, that is Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites who dwelt in Hazazan, Tamar. And the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adam, the king of Zeboam, the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Siddam. And against Kedorlamar, king of Elam, title 
king of the nations, Amorpho, king of Shinar, and Nauroyak, king of Eleazar, four kings against five. Now, it's very interesting because when you see the confederacy of nations and kings coming together, you would automatically assume that these five kings would defend in their own home country, their land, their families, their people against these four kings. But it was not so. In fact, they were overpowered. They were overturned. And it said here that four kings against five. But it's so interesting here that what takes place, because you see as Sodom and Gomorrah become captive, we remember that Lot is living in Sodom. And in verse 10, it continues like this. Now, the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits. Think about this. This valley filled with holes. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot lived, fled or tried to flee from the enemy, and some fell on these ditches. And the remainder fled to the mountains. In fact, they're running for their lives to the mountains. Some uh, were fallen in these ditches. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 11, and all their provisions and went their way. Notice, they took them captive, including Sodom and Gomorrah. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the turmeric tree of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and the brother of Anar, and they were allies with Abram. What happens here is that Lot became a prisoner of war. And this here was his capture was a way of God disciplining him. This was a way of God reminding him that he had no business living in Sodom. Just think about this. He chose for himself. He ended up in Sodom. And Sodom ended up in captivity, which means that Lot was also captive. And the enemy took away all of his goods. And God has a way oftentimes of reminding us that we have to be very careful as to where we pitch our tent. What happened here to Lot? It said that he pitched his tent, chapter 13, as far as Sodom. He pitched his tent as close as he could to the sin of Sodom. And when we compromise that way, when we say, you know what, well, I'm going to pitch my tent as close as I can, knowing there's compromise taking place, notice, we ourselves will be affected. In fact, there are times in our life that we're asking God, Lord, take me out of this place. And we're praying, Lord, would you take me out of this situation when God never called you to be in it in the first place? And it's important that we realize that. First, what did Lot do? He looked at Sodom. Notice what happens. Then he moved to Sodom. Now he was living in Sodom. And notice what happens. Now he's captive in Sodom. Why? Because he was outside of God's will for his life. And this is exactly what happens. When we're outside of God's will for our lives, we will end up slaves to the world. It can be a job. It can be our pride. It can be a vice, an addiction, but when we surround ourselves with bad company, we become slaves to the world and to sin. And the discipline of God comes because he loves his children, because he wants the best for us, and if we don't listen to those rebukes from his word, notice, he'll do whatever, he ta- whatever it takes to get our attention either way, and it usually oftentimes is very painful, <laughs> You know, it's better, we've said it before, that you humble yourself than that God has to humble you. And here Lot was being humbled. It's important that we receive the discipline of God when he's speaking to us, that we don't stiffen our necks, that we don't become stubborn. In Proverbs chapter 3, notice what it says, my son, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't, Don't neglect it. Don't reject it. Don't deny it. Refuse it. Don't resist when God is disciplining your life nor detest his correction, despise what he's speaking to in your life. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. This is the Father, the Son, in whom he delights. Now what's interesting here is that the lifestyle of Sodom and Gomorrah did not prepare them for the conflict that was to come. They were living in sin. Notice, when you're living in sin, when you're backsliding, and then the enemy attacks, you will never be ready. And that's the reason why a lot of Believers oftentimes are defeated in warfare because they weren't ready. 
And Lot wasn't ready here. He saw something that he loved and he moved close to it. It was the lust of the eyes. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, notice what the Apostle John tells us, a warning here. A warning for all of us, do not love the world. Don't be so attracted to the world, or notice, or the things of the world. Notice as it continues, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, what you see, what you desire, what brings you pleasure, and the pride of life is not of the Father. What is it? It is of the world. Whether it brings you pleasure, whether you see it and you lust after it and you want it, or the pride of life, wanting to make something out of yourself in this world, that is not of the Father. That is you loving this life, this world. And it says, and the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Here, Lot was not doing God's will. He was doing his own will. And notice, when Sodom lost the war, notice what happened a lot. He was condemned with the world because he was in it. Now, we see here that, that Abram was a man of honor. He was a guardian of his family. So he fights for his nephew's life and for his nephew's safety. Notice verse 13, because they told Abram, and he goes from being the watcher and watching this happen to being the warrior. When you see something happening that is unjust, that innocent lives are being taken, as a Christian, you should not just watch it. Where's your courage? Where are your convictions at as a matter of God? How can you have a clean conscience if you sit there and do nothing? Abram here was a warrior. He came to rescue his nephew, Lot. This is our responsibility. Then when you see someone in the world, whether it's your family member or it's not, you know what your responsibility is? To pull them out of the world. Not to speak bad about them. Not to condemn them. Not to shame them. You know what Abram does? He goes and puts Lot out of the world. That's the same thing that we need to be doing. Abram here was separated from Sodom, but he was not now so separated that he could not go and help and aid his nephew here. He was separated, but he wasn't isolated. Notice that. He was independent of the world, but he was not indifferent of it. He made himself available to go and help. Notice, we as Christians should not be sitting on the sidelines watching. We, should, we must be men and women of action. Not just watching, but also, notice, doing. Doing. And it says here in verse 13 that they went and they told Abram, the Hebrew, the first time the word of the Hebrew is mentioned in the Bible, which was an outsider of those that lived in the area. But here you see God uses him because Abram heard that Lot was captured. And notice what he did. He mobilized his men. <laughs> he mobilized his men. And this is important for the church today that we would be mobilized. You see what's happening? Mobilize the church. But the teaching of the word of God that you know that you have a responsibility to live out the biblical truth that you receive. And it says, one who had escaped came to Abram and told him as to what would happen, had happened. And in verse 14, now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went into pursuit as far as Dan. <laughs> what did Abram do here? He pursued the army, the confederacy of kings that came and overtook Sodom and the rest of the kings, he took a long-distance journey up north. Now, it's incredible here as you see verse 14 because you see that Abram is walking not only by faith, but here it is also, he's also walking by wisdom. And for us, every time we take steps of faith, it's important that we also take them with wisdom that you receive the confirmation of the word of God, that you're not doing things out of your own emotion and calling it faith, that as you receive confirmation, you're stepping out in faith and stepping out in wisdom. What did he do? He took out 318 men with him that were trained men and were ready 
to defend against the enemy. This is amazing here. You see the leadership of Abram, his, his faith. But why is he fighting here in verse 14? I mean, think, look at what's taking place. He's fighting because he loved Lot and because he wanted to help him. He's fighting for peace. Notice, he's fighting for peace. We have to learn to be men and women of truth with convictions that are willing to fight for peace, a godly peace. In fact, I want you to look at here a few characteristics of what it takes in spiritual warfare to have the victory in the world. I'm going to give you here six characteristics that you find in only one verse as to how to defeat the enemy in spiritual victory that we see here that Abram used as he called these 318 men. Number one, it says that they were born in his house. I love that because it reminds us today that we have to be, if we want to win in spiritual warfare, you notice you have to be born again. Born in the house of God, born in the family of God. Our faith is the victory. Number one, we must be born again. If you want to win in spiritual victory, that's what it takes. 1 John 5, 4, would you note this? For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. You can't overcome the world in the flesh. You can't overcome the world in your own plan. It says whatever now is born of God can overcome the world. And this is the victory. Notice the victory that has overcome the world. What is the victory? Our faith. Our faith is the victory. Number one, notice that. Our faith is the victory. What is the characteristic for winning the war in this world? Number one, our faith is the victory. Number two, it says that they were armed. Would you note that? They were armed. Why is this important to see here as we look at this verse? It, because it, it takes more than zeal. It takes more than emotion. It takes more than courage to win the war. Sometimes people think, well, I, I want to, let me go at it. <laughs> or let me face the enemy. Or I, I, I know we're going to win against the enemy. And you become so passionate. It's zeal, but with, it's without knowledge. You know what happens, zeal without knowledge, what it is? Immaturity. And here you see that they were armed. We must know that, number one, our faith is the victory, and number two, we must be armed. You have to have the correct equipment. And what is the equipment for us in spiritual warfare? The whole armor of God to use our spiritual weapons that God has provided. Today, maybe you find yourself in a battle. Notice, number one, your faith is a victory, trusting in God. Number two, you must be armed with the full armor of God. Put on the whole armor, Ephesians 6.10 says. And notice that our weapons that we fight with are not fleshy, they're not carnal, but they're spiritual. What does that mean? That we shouldn't try to fight against spiritual warfare in the flesh. If you respond in the flesh when it comes to spiritual warfare, you will be defeated. We need to respond, you know how, in the spirit, with the spiritual weapons that God has provided for us in his word by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. Somebody who wants to fight against you in the flesh, notice, do not fight back in the flesh. Submit yourself to the spirit. Don't respond. Let God defend you. Go to prayer. Go to his word. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. What is it that you are to do right now? If there's a problem, there's warfare in your house, you know what you need to do? Hit your knees on the ground and start praying. That's where the battle is won, on our knees. For pulling down strongholds. That's how we pull down strongholds as Christians. For casting down arguments, arguments, division within the body of Christ, division within the world and in the home. Notice, in every high things that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What are we to do? Bring that thought captive as you war against this warfare in the spirit and not in the flesh. 
How are you to do it? In the power of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God and prayer being the most effective weapons as we continue in spiritual warfare. We must use them by faith. Number one, faith is the victory. Number two, you must be armed with the right equipment. Number three, it says they were trained. Look at the verse there, verse 14. It says trained servants. The word trained means that he equipped an army. (laughs) It's important that you are trained as to how to use the equipment. No matter how good the equipment is, if the soldier is not trained, they will easily be defeated. There's so many people here that that know about the armor, but don't know how to use it. And here it says that these servants were trained. I want to ask you, are you being trained right now? As you come in, you're listening to the word of God. You're being trained, but are you training yourself? Are you disciplining yourself to be trained in the word of God every single day? So then when you go out to spiritual warfare out in the battle in the world every single day, you know that you've been trained that day. That you're exercising, that you're putting on the armor of God. That's why the local church exists. For the purpose of training others to use the Bible effectively, how to pray, how to recognize, how to discern the enemy. How to follow Christ as a soldier in his army. The better that you know Scripture and the truth of God's Word, the better that you will be equipped to fight in the battle. You must know the Word. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, would you note this tonight? All Scripture, this is why you need to know the Bible. If you want to win in warfare, have a high view of Scripture, a low view of self. (laughs) Trusting in the Bible, don't trust yourself. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is inspired by God. And it is profitable, it is useful for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, notice what it says, that you would be mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You want to be thoroughly equipped? Then open up your Bible. (laughs) That is how you find yourself in warfare, being able to face the enemy, because number one, you recognize that faith is the victory, that you must be armed with the armor of God, but number three, you must be trained. Number four, notice what happens here in verse 14. They trusted their leader. You know why a lot of soldiers in the Christian army oftentimes fail is because they go rogue. You know what that means? I don't need a leader. I can do my own thing. (laughs) Everybody needs a leader. It's been said before, the problem with the church is that there's too many generals and not enough privates. Everybody wants to be in charge. In fact, they trusted their leader and they rode 120 miles. As it describes from the place they were to arrive there as to make a surprise attack on these four kings and they want a complete victory because Abram received his directions from the Lord and this entire undertaking was a victory of faith. Why? Because one man was hearing from the Lord. If you want the victory, you must trust in what the Lord is doing and obey his orders. They trusted their leader. They say, whatever the Lord is saying right now, we're going to follow We're not going to question. We're going to follow because we also want the victory. The faith was the victory. Notice, they were equipped for war. They were trained. They trusted their leader. Number five, they were united. You see that in verse 14. It wasn't three armies with three different leaders. It was one army, and Abram was in charge. I mean, think about what would happen if we were all united in the perfect love that the Bible talks about found in Jesus Christ, we would win more victories as a church. You know what the church needs in order to see more victories? The love of Christ. The love of Christ is the beginning of victory. And today we need to recognize that. They were united. But finally, number six, as you see this, they were single-minded. 
And we have to understand that today. If we want to win in spiritual warfare together, we need to be single-minded people. What does it mean? That the goal was not a personal revenge or a private gain, but notice here, the goal here was victory over the enemies so that the captives could be freed. The double-minded soldier is destined for defeat. No, I, I want to say that so that you would remember that tonight. The double-minded soldier is destined for defeat. You want to know why? Because he doesn't know what he wants. He has one foot in the world and one foot in the warfare. Paul told Timothy as a warning, he said this, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. If you're engaged in warfare, don't entangle yourself with this world. You know what's important for us to remember? That we are either engaged or we're entangled. You can't entangle yourself with the world. You have to remember that you're in warfare. And notice, this is exactly what happens here. It says, he divided his forces against them by night. And he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is in the north of Damascus, so they deployed, now they mobilize. Verse 15, dividing the forces by night, they attacked, pursued them. And you see that Abram here is using wisdom as he tactfully succeeded in rescuing and in recovering. And in verse 16, so he brought back, I want you to circle that in your Bible, brought back all the goods. And he also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the woman and the people. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like redemption there. <laughs> that the enemy tried to take our lives at one point. He tried to hold us captive in Sodom. You know what the Lord did? He rescued us and he brought us back from that sin that we had entangled ourselves in. That the Lord has done that for us. In fact, think about this as you read this. 318 men against four kings and their men. <laughs> and why is it that 318 trained servants were able to defeat these four kings and their armies? Why? Even though they were outnumbered by these kings and their armies, these 318 men saw the victory. Why is that? Proverbs chapter 21, verse 31 tells us this. The horse is prepared for the day of battle. Sometimes people find their strength in what they have, in number and quantity, but it says, but deliverance is of the Lord. It doesn't matter how that enemy prepares himself. We know that deliverance is from God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 15, as the Lord spoke to the nation of Israel, to the tribe of Judah, he said, Listen, all of you, Judah, and all of you inhabitants of Jerusalem, you King Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat needed encouragement. Notice what the Lord says to you right now if you find yourself in warfare. Thus says the Lord to you. This is what the Lord's saying to you right now. Do not be afraid. They're coming against you. Don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged. You find yourself in opposition. Don't be discouraged because of this great multitude, overwhelmed, outnumbered. And you notice what the Lord says, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tonight, you can know that the battle is not yours, the battle is God's. And with that in mind, notice what Abram did, with that in mind, what did he do? He fought for his family. He fought for the innocent. He didn't just watch. He became a warrior. He was invested there. That's why we, as we see someone in need, we don't have to ask them, you know what, hey, are you a believer? Are you not a believer? Can I hear your testimony before I help you? You know what we are to do as salt and light? Move in action and move in love. Galatians 6.10, it says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. It says to all. But then especially to those who are of the household of faith. 
Do good to everyone, and then especially to those that are of the faith. Sacrificial service is one of the ways of us showing love and the love of Christ to other people. What did Jesus say? Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Here, Abram was demonstrating that he was salt and light, that he cared for the life of the innocent. Now think about this. If Christians don't carry their share of the common burden of life, then how can the salt of the earth and the light of the world be seen? Abram is showing us here. He's learning, having learned an important lesson in Egypt of what it means, of what it means, notice, to protect the innocent. You see there that Lot and the rest were taken hostage. What does he do? He goes out and he fights for them. Now we may see in this account of Abraham's rescue to Lot that we too were those that were off in our sins in shame, in sin, in disobedience, in rebellion. But we were rescued by one who left all glory, who left all majesty, made himself a man, our kinsman redeemer, went through great suffering and trouble by defeating even the mightiest foe, the devil. And he brought us out of the bondage and the slavery of sin. And he's brought us back and he's recovered everything that the enemy has stolen. That is what Jesus Christ has done for us. And you see that illustration here. Now the sad thing about this is that Abraham pulled Lot out of Sodom. You know what Lot did later on in the book of Genesis? Instead of staying with Abram, you notice what he did. Instead of repenting of going to Sodom, Lot returned to Sodom. (laughs) He had been reunited with Abram. But you know what he did? He chose to go back to sin. Let us not be that backslidden believer tonight that after the Lord has rescued us, we choose to go back to sin. That tonight we would say we want to stay close to the redemption and the blood of Jesus Christ. Because the attacks may come, but we know that the battle belongs to the Lord. Amen. Let's pray.